is Jasmine Brown, and I was a critical care therapist. Um, critical care three was my title, and I worked at a local hospital on the floor as an ICU. Um, I've been a therapist for 12 years. Um, I think if I did my math right, uh, graduated in 06 and um, continued to work through still being a professor at a university in the area. And um, I did a lot of critical care in the CCU in another state. And I worked in a 28 bed uh, CVICU and ICU. So I've always been in critical care um, and only had a shorter amount of time on the floor. That's a good question. It's, it's to be an integral part of the care for a patient that's critically ill. And that's kind of putting it softly, but there's so many aspects that you can be involved in in critical care. But I think the key to it is being involved. Like I don't wanna be in a critical care and just be turning knobs. I wanna bring my knowledge to the table, my expertise and my experience to the team so they know what knowledge is in the room and how we add value to the care of a patient. By far, it was my training in school. Um, I'm not sure that people realize that in most um, RT programs, you spend five semesters in school, right? And four of those semesters are critically care based. So we're getting ACLS, BLS, NRP, PALS, hemodynamics classes, ventilator classes, and all of this is not really taking place on the floor, although um, obviously you use those special certifications on the floor, but it's geared toward critical care. And um, I find that closer to the latter part of my school and going through the IC rot ICU rotations, I was very passionate about all of the different pieces that you can put together like a puzzle piece in the ICU is something that really just spoke to me. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I think it takes different respiratory therapists to work in any area. Um, I think I tried to, I worked at a PFT lab for a little bit and I was stressed out about that. <laughs> I was like, blah, 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 you know, so it takes a different type of therapist to work in every area. So I won't say or discount and say that anybody's job is more stressful than the other. I think you just have to figure out what is not stressful to you. When I feel, when I was in ICU, I did not feel stressed. I felt in control because I had all the pieces there. It's a smaller amount of people and it's very one-on-one um, -on -one care versus I think I felt more stressed on the floor because you have so many people to manage and you never know what's going to pop off, as you say. And I'm not a, an ER person because I don't know what's going to roll through the door. And even though it's like that with ICU, I'm not an adrenaline junkie. So I think that um, you trying to find your niche helps you to figure out where you need to be. Very important. Um, speaking of that work-life balance, um, when I was working at that huge hospital um, with that in that huge ICU with everything that was going on, um, one of the benefits at the, that particular hospital was that they had a gym in the basement. And so that's a great stress relief to go down there and, you know, jump on the elliptical treadmill, or lift some weights or do something like that. Um, because I've married, been married for 20 something years and we have four kids. And so uh, that's a lot of work-life balance. But I do find that you can find out when it's time for a timeout by listening to your body, listening to yourself, paying attention to your own responses to people, I'm a chit chat person, um, kind of like the life of the party of bubbly. If somebody comes up to me and say, well, you just haven't been yourself. And then I, oh, I'm fine. You know, and then somebody says it two or three times. I feel like two or three witnesses saying something to you, you say, you know what? Maybe I need to step back because there's something happening with my transactions with people. If I notice that I'm a little bit more snippy or I feel a little bit more aggravated, there's not a day that I don't wake up ready to go to work. Um, I love being a respiratory therapist. So the days that I'm just like, oh, then I'm like, maybe I need to not pick up this extra day because all money is not good money. <laughs> the students that are enrolled now during the pandemic are more aware of those critical care skills and where they could be in use. Um, so they may be a little bit more gun ho with doing that. 
And I think that's a good thing. I think um, the pandemic is not something that we would wish on anybody, but it has brought some um, attention to our profession in, in some way. I think that because if a student is trying to go towards critical care, I would say try it all. Um, and when I say that is going back to what I said before, just because you're not a critical care therapist doesn't mean that what you're doing is not valuable. I think that a lot of times we like to put everything in a category. You know, I'm an ICU therapist, I'm a this therapist, this therapist. But if you try everything, then you'll know what type of therapist you are. Take that PFT. Nobody wants to cross train a PFT, take it. You might find that you have a passion for it because I don't want anybody in the ICU that doesn't have a passion for it. I don't want anybody in the PFT lab that's not gonna be blowing everybody away, right? I don't, I don't want that. Um, because I don't want you to take care of my family member like that. Um, and so I would encourage them to say, don't be afraid of it. Just go ahead and try it. And if you find it's not for you, no harm, no foul. Then try another area. That's the great thing about respiratory care. There's so many facets and areas that we can work in. Absolutely. Everybody has to breathe. <laughs> Everybody has to breathe. And um, and also too, with the roles of us, uh, of our teeth expanding, we got the APRT that's in the works, that Advanced Practice Respiratory Therapist um, credential that they're working on. And I know it's being piloted in a couple states. Also with the pandemic, I think, you know, a couple years of that and people knowing our roles now, we being involved in telehealth, we got approved for that. And so there's only expansion on the horizon. And I think with the new cusp of all the information that's out now and about what we bring to the table, I don't see where that's going to diminish. And as long as I have, since I've been out of school, I mean, I got hired before I graduated school um, and I have not been unemployed since. Um, here recently, uh, just end of July, um, I stopped working um, because I'm also a professor and I'm already looking for a PRN job <laughs> again. But I've tried to make sure that I had enough time to dedicate to the students. They'll be successful during this pandemic and social distancing. So it's a lot of extra study sessions and extra classes and extra labs um, to prepare people for moving out into that pandemic. So that was the third choice that I made, but I really do miss it. <laughs> Um, because I'm being intentional to be a good clinician. I think we can only bring our best to the table. And from a personal experience, my mom had sarcoidosis and she was uh, diagnosed with it years, well, she wasn't diagnosed with it. She struggled with it years ago, back in the 70s. Nobody really knew what it was and finally got under some treatment when they discovered what it was like late 80s or early 90s. And Towards the end of her life, I remember going into a hospital and there is a clinician in there taking care of, of, of my mother, not paying attention to the things that I was saying, paying attention to my mom. And I have been her caregiver, not being intentional about being that um, attentive healthcare worker. And she had a rapid response. There was no reason because I said this exact thing. And so that stays with me but I have always been a patient advocate. So that is the thing that I know that I am doing a great job because I'm intentional about being a patient advocate. It's more than just about um, saying that I save lives or, you know, I'm a respiratory therapist, but do you really do what you were trained to do? And sometimes you stay late. Sometimes, you know, you might get on your coworkers nerves because you have this extra long report with all the details. Um, but that's, you're not there for your co-workers in that regard. You're there to take care of the patient and have always been that person. And you will find that a lot of respiratory therapists, when you're passionate about it, being part of the AARC and those things, that's why I love going to the meetings because you find people with that same level of passion that don't look at like, you're a weirdo, <laughs> right? No, we are all weirdos and we are standing here together taking care of patients and saving lives. So um, that's how I know is because I'm intentional about it. Um, I remember being in a CVICU and I had a patient that was a um, injured vet and he had PTSD and he was experiencing, you know, respiratory distress and, you know, those, he's just anxious, he's just anxious. And um, I remember, and I, and I was younger, this has probably been, oh, wow, 
you know, 10 years ago or something. But this is probably to date the most impactful um, moment that I had as, as an RT that reminded me why I decided to be an RT and um, why I continue to be a patient advocate. I understand that people get anxious and we go about our day anxiety, you know, kind of takes over some patients, but I passed by the door and he was gripping the bed and I could have kept walking. You know, I, I had, I, I'll be honest, I had a thought about it because I was going to do another treatment, but something inside of me said, just go pop in. So I went in and, and I talked to this gentleman and apparently there was uh, something going on in the next room, but it reminded him shell shock or gun sounds or something. And when I tell you tears were streaming from his eye, his gripping the bed, his heart rate was going up. So I thought, okay, I can justify this. This, this is a respiratory issue, right? And so I sat there and I just sit on side of his bed and I held his hand and he just cried and cried. He said, thank you. You're the only person that has been in here. And he said, I just feel so scared. And so I just sat there with him maybe like seven minutes it wasn't in the big scheme of things it wasn't a long time until he dozed off to sleep and later the next day he i passed by his room he said i slept so good thank you so much for taking the time to just calm me down and so i will never forget that it was something very small didn't have anything really to do with respiratory therapy but just being intentional about being a patient advocate and i think a lot of times that means you know fighting for the patient but in a small way i was because if that anxiety continues, I would have been there anyway, right? And so taking that seven minutes only put me behind a little bit and he's okay for the next couple of days, right? And so I just feel like sometimes we lose that in the business hustle and bustle and I understand um, because I've been there before. But if we are more intentional, those are the moments that give you the strength to draw from when you are tired and you're just like, oh man, I don't want to you know, do this. You can pull that moment and say, you know, I'm going to go ahead and stop. Like, I really don't have time, but I'm going to go ahead and stop. But you have to first create that moment. So then when you have to decide between rushing by or this moment, you can pull from the moment you had before. So you have to create those, those moments that you can draw from. Um, there's been a lot of change. The first... Uh, day. So I, I was working PRN because I'm the director of clinical education and I, I feel a conviction to make sure I stay relevant. So I was keeping my PRN job to um, try to keep that up. Um, when the pandemic first hit in our area, I was actually working and I was I volunteered to go in um, because I felt like I should be out there with my fellow respiratory care practitioners. Um, and I ended up actually intubating a patient that um, ended up having um, COVID and what was, what was seemed so surreal is that when we came in, it was just a regular, it, it was just a regular patient. Nobody was suspecting anything. Um, I volunteered because they were being pulled to a bigger hospital where it was. So I was at this smaller hospital. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, but I did completely put on everything, um, even though they said it wasn't necessary and come to find out. And then in a matter from that moment to four days later, we were like overran. And I was just thinking, oh my gosh. And then, you know, being exposure, then I had to quarantine myself. So just how quickly one moment can change the a whole community. I've never had seen it like that before. Like I've worked at big hospitals during COPD season or the flu season and different things where people are coming in, but like to the magnitude that it happened and how fast, it's not like somebody catches COPD and then this person gets COPD, right? But just how fast it hit uh, and how unprepared we were, um, I don't know, it kind of shook me a little bit. I'm gonna be honest. And um, I volunteered as much as I could in between trying to, you know, put together what we were gonna do at the university. Um, and it was tough times. And the hardest part was there's people standing outside at the hospital I was working at the time was a one level hospital. And so there's family members standing outside trying to see their outside the window, trying to see their family member because they can't come in. It's just like, I never pictured anything like that ever in my life you know people crying people dying without people at the bedside no family it it's it's something that you'll never forget it's something that you'll never forget 
is so much value in it. And also because sharing stories like these and seeing how people forge the way for change in our profession and getting involved so that we can um, make more money and we can um, let the nation know what we bring to the table because we still are fairly a young profession a little over 50 years old and so i think it's very important that we continue to grow our membership to say okay that if we have a voice then we can make change so it's important for people to join so we can push more rights and get reimbursement of different things and um I just think, and also it's a good place to go to stay abreast of all the stuff that's going on with the pandemic and the statistics and what the, the new findings are without trying to read all over the news. There's one place where you can go. And um, I just want to encourage people to be a part of that movement and to be a part of um, what's coming up. You don't want to miss out on what respiratory therapists are going to come up with and how we're going to grow. So looking for that growth spurt.